worked together and never gave up our dream of a better society. I joked about being out of work. But it wasn't meant to be so because in July that, su uh, that summer, that year, a young man from Kenya, his name is Paul Otto Ramses, he had applied for political asylum in Iceland along with his wife and a newborn son. But he was brutally expelled from Iceland by the authorities. One night, the police came, knocked on his door, they spoke Icelandic to him, he didn't understand the word, they gave him a letter in Icelandic, he couldn't read that. But anyway, they took him to the airport, put him on a plane, sent him to Rome, where he was supposed to be delivered back to Kenya, which would probably have cost his life. This was something we didn't like to see happening in our society. I was going to protest, but there were a few young people ahead of me, down in front of the office of the Minister of Justice. And which was fine, but like many times in Iceland, you don't protest. It's not a very decent thing to do. So they were just doing a small protest, and that was it. So I said to them, is that all? And they said, yes. So I said to them, do you mind if I take over? No, it's okay. All right. So from now on, we will meet here at 12 o'clock, at noon, every day, and protest. I will stand here. Then I called some of my friends, intellectuals and artists, and I said, do you agree on this treatment the man had gotten from our authorities? They said, no. So come down here. Help me. And they did. I found out who the lawyer of the young man was. I called her. And she told me she was filing a complaint. It would, it would take her a few days to do so. So I said, all right, while you are writing the complaints and, the, uh, and all that, I will stand there every day with a lot of people. I used my home page, which had, had, been, had, had been running for a few years. There were a few thousand people reading it. And we stood there every 12 o'clock, shouted and told the minister, bring back Paul Ramses, give him a fair trial. The very day his lawyer put in uh, her complaint, or yeah, I think it's called complaint, to the minister, I said, okay, I'll give you one month to bring Paul Ramses back and give him a fair trial. But we would like to see him to get an Icelandic citizenship, an apology for this shameful treatment. Exactly one month later, Paul Ramses was not in Iceland, but I was in front of the office of the Minister of Justice. He wasn't very happy about that. He thought he, we had forgotten about it. His assistant came out and said to me, look, Harder, you don't have to do this. The minister has said that he will bring Paul back in August. I said, yes, I read that in the paper, but I also know politician, because he didn't specify the year. <laughs> so we will stand here every day. This was on Thursday. Paul Ramses was brought back to Iceland on Tuesday. It pays off to protest. And this is the second time in my life where I felt the I became us. Many people tell me they are not interested in politics. And that's very strange to me since politics is about our life. Being interested in politics 
does not mean you have to be a member of a political party. A political party does not own politics, no more than the birds own the sky. I think that one of the roles of an artist is to criticize society, to help people to see things differently from another angle, and to criticize politicians and political parties. Criticism is a form of love. We have, have to use it. We have to use reason, yes. But we also have to remember the unseen, the unproven, our feelings, our cultural roots that cannot always be reasoned. It is called creativity and works perfectly with reason. So now I want to take you back to the year 2006, October, no 2008, sorry, October the 6th. That's the day we call in Iceland the day of the crash. We knew there was something strange going on. But what was it? We didn't know. But at four o'clock that day, the Prime Minister of Iceland, Dave Hauser, came on the national t TV and addressed the nation. He spoke very seriously. And he ended with a very dramatic word. God bless Iceland. To me and many other people, this ending sounded like the Third World War had started. And it had, in a way, only this time not with firearms and bombs, but with money, greed, and corruption. The banks were closed that day. The krauna devaluated dramatically, nearly 200%. People abroad could not use their credit cards anymore. How could they go home? How could they eat? How could they pay the hotel bills? We heard about people everywhere in shock. We were, as a nation, in shock. That was the simple word to describe it. To most Icelanders, this was unbelievable, and we really found it hard to understand what had happened. We were confused and scared. We were simply in shock. How could this have happened? We had been told for years that Iceland was considered to be one of the richest countries in the world. And in one day, we were placed among the poorest and the most indebted ones. According to the politicians and bank managers, this just happened. And they could do nothing about it, so they were most certainly not responsible. And we the people, we should just continue with our lives as nothing had happened and leave them to take care of business as usual. No, thank you. We did not agree. I was quite busy. I was working with an author. I was doing my biography. So, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I heard of people in the street trying to protest. Desperate people, angry people. It seemed to be all over. The media wasn't really telling us what happened, except it was the Americans' fault. But that didn't fit. Now, I went to a protest in front of the National Bank, National Bank in Iceland, and there was a group of angry people shouting. And to me, they were just shouting, they were angry. So I said to them, look, tomorrow at noon, I will place myself in front of the parliament building 
please come down there. And I put this on my homepage, and I asked them, can you please spread the word? Not many people met up. But I stood there asking two questions to everyone who passed by. I asked them, can you tell me what has happened in this country? And can you tell, do you have any idea of what we can do about it? People were very scared, shy, and it didn't take me long to understand that something had to be do, done about the situation. So I decided to be, uh, make a bigger uh, protest meeting. I rented a sound system, a car, to have a stage. I called my friends, asking them to come and talk to the people. We were so confused and scared. The first meeting was a week later after I started, started stood there in front of the parliament. And we faced thousands of people. All of a sudden, there were thousands of people, angry people. What do you do with thousands of angry people? I spoke about anger. I told them, you are not alone. We are all together in this. Please to talk to the next person to you. Be friends. Let's stick together. Let's protest. But first of all, talk about your emotions. Talk about how scared we, you are. We all are. And then I said to people, I want to do this peacefully. I want to use, we use our brains, not our fists. Because I know and you know that angry people have the tendency of attacking something, breaking something, ruining something, blaming someone. And I asked them, do you want, will you support me in doing this peacefully? And thousands of people shouted, yes. And I asked them, do you want another meeting a week from now, here at the same spot, same time? And thousands said, yes. Good. Then I said, okay, will you help me? And they shouted, yes. All right, let's do it. I started working, I started walking around, talking to people every day because it's not enough to stand and protest. Because I went around, I asked people, what is it we want? It took me almost three weeks to formulate a demand. And on the third, I think it was the third big meeting when I stepped up and I asked people three questions. Do you want the government to resign. Thousands said yes. And I asked them, do you want the board of the financial supervisory authority to resign? And thousands said yes. And the third, do you want the board of the national bank to, sh uh, to resign? And thousands said, yes. This became the glue of all the meetings that winter. This is what we shouted about every Saturday at 3 o'clock. We started every meeting by saying, this is peaceful. We will do this peacefully. I do you agree? And everybody shouted, yes. And in the end, I said to people, do you want another meeting a week from now? And everybody shouted, yes. So, 
There were all kinds of protests going on around Reykjavik. I called my friends around on the countryside. I said, come join us. Keep a protest meeting in your village and at Saturdays at 3 o'clock. I will guide you, I will help you, I will provide you with speakers or whatever. Let's work together. It started going around the island. There were all kinds of protests. And it almost became a fashion. And we created or started an organization which we call the People's Voices. The Prime Minister, Jane Harder, he pretended we didn't exist. And the media as well. They tried to make us look like criminals or idiots. I think the word idiot was the Prime Minister used about us. Uh, he called us idiots. And I was very happy to hear him say that. I wasn't insulted. I was happy. Why? Because I knew we were getting to him. He was getting irritated. That was our purpose. Results are difficult to obtain. And in the second week of December, after two months of protests, it looked like that most people had lost interest in protesting. People stayed away. They were tired, cold, and had lost the hope that something could ever be done or changed. This is useless, many said, and we must use uh, violence, others said. Others demanded me to stop this. Resign, they said. Resign. And I said, you cannot resign unless you've been hired by someone. So, we at the People's Voices, we sent out an announcement saying we respected the Christmas tradition and we encouraged people to celebrate with loved ones, family, friends, and take a good rest. We at the People's Voices, we would stand there both Saturdays in early December and as the representatives until they were ready to come back right after Christmas. And furthermore, we would mirror the silence of the government by making a silent protest in front of the Parliament House. And that upset many people. And that was the purpose. You have to slap the face of people once in a while to wake them up. 